now time for oral questions. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question uh, directed to the Premier. Um, Premier, your testimony yesterday at the Gas Plant Committee was highly evasive. It strained the bounds of credibility and was obviously deeply disappointed all of us. In fact, the Premier, you've lost the moral authority to govern when you conduct that kind of performance on such an important issue. One of the many items that was far from clear in your answers, I want to make sure you have a chance to answer it today. When did you first ask for a briefing from Colin Anderson of the OPA to get a full cost of the cancellations of Oakville and Mississauga, and who ordered the cover-up of information around those costs? When did you ask for that meeting? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, uh, I did. I spent an hour and a half at the committee yesterday, Mr. Speaker. I answered all the questions that were uh, directed towards me, Mr. Speaker. And, and that is that ha was and has been part of my commitment to be open and transparent. And I told the committee, Mr. Speaker, exactly what I knew and when I knew it. So, Mr. Speaker, I, uh, I hope that the leader of the of the opposition will check answered because my answers are recorded there. Supplementary. The, um, again, uh, I, I want to give—I know the Premier has been highly evasive on her answers with respect to the cancellation of the gas plants in Oakland, Mississauga, so I do, Speaker, want to give her another opportunity. Order. The member from the Minister of Training College and Universities come to order. The member for Renfrew come to order. Leader. Um, and Unfortunately, true to recent form, you avoided my very simple question just now, Premier. So I'll give you another opportunity, please, to be direct with us. I would um, like to know uh, exactly when you asked for a full briefing from Colin Anderson of the Ontario Power Authority in your capacity as Premier of the Province of Ontario on one of the biggest scandals in our province. Surely one of the first meetings you called for was a full briefing a thorough disclosure of the costs and who ordered the cover-up. Premier, exactly Question. when did that meeting take place? Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I, uh, I disagree with the, the language that the uh, leader of the opposition is using. I don't accept the premise of his uh, of his question. But, Mr. Speaker, I said I was I was at the committee yesterday. I answered the question. I tabled the documents that uh, I had received from the OPA, Mr. Speaker. And I, from the time I was in this office, I was in conversation with. Uh, from the time we were sworn in, I was in conversation with the Minister of Energy. The information that we were receiving through the OPA, I tabled yesterday, Mr. Speaker. And the reason that the leader of the of the opposition is asking these questions is because I tabled those documents yesterday, Mr. Speaker. I brought them to the committee. I made them available, and the OPA estimates were different from what we had previously been told. And in fact, yesterday there was another number. The information was different again, Mr. Speaker. That's why it was very important that the Auditor General write his report. That's why I asked the Answer. Auditor General to write his report, and I believe that it's important we wait for that report, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. The member from Renfrew, uh, your, your leader, wants to put the supplementary question. Thank you. Final supplementary. Thank you. Um, again, premiering this re respectfully, you're not answering a very simple question. It seems to me that the a very basic first meeting you'd ask for as a new premier would be to sit down and meet with Colin Anderson of the Ontario Power Authority and ask him for the full costing of the cancellation of the Oakville and the Saw gas plants and ask him who ordered the cover-up. This seems to me fundamental. Yesterday in committee, you did say you didn't know, we didn't know, but respectfully, Premier, it's your job to actually Minister of the Environment, come to, order. to know the facts. Premier, you wanted the job, you campaigned for the job, you asked for the job. I ask you respectfully, why aren't you doing the job? Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> and I'm very much. Seated, please. Seated, please. Thank you, Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm very much looking forward to the opposition leader's testimony about his yeah. costing. Mr. Speaker, I'd, I'd like to know what his what his uh, thoughts are about how they were uh, they expected the what they expected the cost to be. Uh, and I, you know, I, I look forward to that. I don't know exactly when he's going to appear before committee, but I've been there, Mr. Speaker. I told the committee what I knew, and the reality is that the numbers kept changing and keep changing, Mr. Speaker. Sorry, I'm going to cough. Um, 
<laughs> and that is the reality. That's why we need to wait for the Auditor General's report, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. Leader of the Opposition. Still no answer. You know, um, firstly, uh, Speaker, I, I did not get an answer on if the Premier did have a briefing from Colin Anderson. Minister of Social Services, come to order. Uh, why she was woefully negligent to the Premier Speaker. Thank why you. she was woefully negligent and not addressing that as one of your first meetings. I would think that would be the basics of the job. Yesterday, you were supposed to clear the air. You left a lot more questions unanswered. So, Speaker, I didn't get an answer to my first question of why the Premier was woefully neglectful in her duties as Premier to get the bottom of that. Respectfully, it is your duty, Premier, to know those answers, not try to cover them up. There's another important distinction there at committee. Colin Anderson basically said yesterday in the morning that everybody knew the cost of the gas plant. You say that's not true. A very basic question, question. who's telling the truth, you or Colin Anderson? Who's telling the truth, Premier? The, uh, the leader is... The Minister of Energy, come to order, please. Uh, the, uh, the leader is using language that is tightrope walking in terms of some of the things he said, so I'm just going to give him a caution now that if it's. Uh, I need everyone's attention. Uh, so I would uh, ask the, the, the leader to be cautious of that uh, type of language. Premier? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, the reality is that the complexity of calculating the costs of the relocation of these plants has meant that the costs keep changing, Mr. Speaker, in terms of the information that I received from the OPA. I had, I had briefings with energy officials, Mr. Speaker, from the time I came into this office. I was dedicated to making sure that we had a process that was going to open up the opportunity for the uh, members of the opposition and the third party to ask the questions that they needed to ask. I made it very clear that I was going to appear before committee. I have done everything that I could since I came into this office, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that the process was opened up. The reality is that the calculation of the numbers has changed. The information that we have gotten has changed, and it changed as recently as yes, yesterday sir. morning, Mr. Speaker. I tabled documents that made it clear that at one point there was one number and there was a different number yesterday. That's Thank why we need to wait for the Auditor General's report, Thank Mr. You. Speaker. Supplementary. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Speaker, and I appreciate it. I am trying to walk that line. It is a difficult balance, but I think you understand, Speaker, the seriousness of this issue and that the, the credibility of the Premier of the Province of Ontario is at stake. Um, Premier, now you say that the numbers kept changing. I think you're basically saying that you never asked for a briefing to get finality on those numbers. You decided to look the other way, or you knew and you refused to tell us Either way, that undermines our ability to put confidence in you to lead this province of Ontario. You stood here in the legislature and publicly and said the costs were $40 million, and all the while you knew the costs were far in excess of that $40 million. So if you're willing to say something that you know was not in keeping with the facts, why should we have any faith of you to be honest with the taxpayers of Ontario when you yourself were involved in covering up this scandal or the cancellation of Please. 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 Now I will ask the member to withdraw. Withdraw. Premier. Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the contention, the assertion of the Leader of the Opposition is simply not true, Mr. Speaker. I appeared at committee yesterday. I talked about the Cabinet meetings that I had attended. I talked about the information that I was given. I made it clear that the information that I, had given, I was given changed, Mr. Speaker. The numbers changed, and the OPA appeared at committee yesterday and made it very clear that the numbers had changed. And the information they had given. Order, please. Please finish. The OPA made it clear, Mr. Speaker, that the numbers that had been given to us were not the same numbers that they were bringing forward yesterday. Please There's speak. nobody in this legislature, Mr. Speaker, who wants the information clearly on the table. Nobody wants that more than I do, Mr. Speaker, which is why I've done what I've done for the last number of weeks. I will continue to do that work no matter what the Leader of the Opposition says, Mr. Speaker. You see it, please? You see it, please? Final supplementary. Here, 
Uh, Willful blindness. Respectfully, Premier, uh, ignorance is no excuse. Willful blindness is no excuse. You are the Premier of the province of Ontario. You have the ability and you have the responsibility to compel an answer. It should have Order. been one of your first meetings. And quite frankly, you say the number. Member from rural, changed. the Minister of Rural Affairs, come to your order. Answers change. I think, quite General, frankly, come to Speaker, order. that means it's time for a change in the province of Ontario to get us down an entirely different path. <laughs> Premier, your answers today, your answers to the committee yesterday, were highly evasive. They strain the bounds of credibility. Quite frankly, you've lost the moral authority to govern. I will ask you respectfully to put before Question. the legislature a confidence vote when it comes to the Liberals continuing to put their interests ahead of taxpayers. Thank you. Will you call that confidence Thank measure for a vote today? Seated, please. Seated, please. Premier. Much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, you know I answered the questions yesterday, and now, Mr. Speaker, I'm looking forward to a very large confidence issue coming before this house, and that would be the budget, Mr. Speaker. We are focused on youth unemployment. We're focused on investing in roads and bridges, infrastructure around the province, Mr. Speaker. We're focusing on a fair and a prosperous Ontario, Mr. Speaker. We're focusing on investing in the music industry, Mr. Speaker. Those are the issues that will come before us. That will be the confidence issue that we discuss, Mr. Speaker. I sincerely hope that the opposition members read the budget, that they determine whether they want to support that budget based on the merits of the budget, Mr. Speaker, because I believe that those issues touch the people of Ontario every single day. That's what we're going to focus on, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Uh, would the Premier agree that our job here as elected members is to put the public interest, the needs of the people who elected us, ahead of the interests of well-connected insiders or the political interests of our parties? Premier. Absolutely, Mr. Speaker, and I would suggest that everything that uh, everything I've done as an elected official, and certainly everything that I've done in this office as Premier, has been has been directed at making sure that we do do act in the best interests of the people of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. That's what government exists to do. That is why we have government, Mr. Speaker, to act in the collective interest, the best interests of the people of Ontario. Thank you. Supplementary. Geez, even spending $10 billion on uh, gas plants to uh, save Liberal seats? That doesn't sound like the public interest to me. That sounds like the Liberal interest, Speaker. <laughs> yesterday in committee, yesterday in, committee hearings, uh, in the committee hearings, the, the Premier admitted that as a Cabinet Minister, she signed off, herself signed off, on the Cabinet decisions scrapping the private power deal in Oakville without asking any questions at all about the cost. And as co-chair of the Liberal campaign, the Premier didn't even ask any questions about the cost of cancelling private, the power, private power deal in Mississauga as the co-chair of the campaign. Why didn't the Premier ask a single question on behalf of the people who would be stuck paying the bills, the massive bills, for those decisions? Question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And again, I answered, I answered these questions yesterday at committee. The reality is that the relocation of these plants was the subject of a negotiation, Mr. Speaker. I was a member of a cabinet that was implementing that decision that the third party and the, uh, the opposition had agreed needed to happen, Mr. Speaker. We were implementing that. There was a negotiation. And the reality is, Mr. Speaker, that those numbers were not available. We did not discuss the specifics of the negotiation that was happening at the table, and I would expect that the leader of the third party would understand how negotiation works and that it actually needs to be a confidential process, Mr. Speaker, and not every member of the Cabinet had access to those specific numbers. Thank you. Final supplementary. What I understand is, regardless of what happens in a negotiation, people have a, an estimate, a ballpark idea of what they're going to have to spend when something like this gets decided. During the election campaign, I was asked, Speaker, whether I would commit to scrapping those plants. And I wanted to. I wanted to. Since the Liberal government's decision to sign that private debt power deal in the first place was the wrong decision. But I would not make that commitment, Speaker, because the government refused to make the documents public. They refused to make the contracts public, and we had been asking for those contracts time and time again. And I didn't know the cost, Speaker. 
And the Premier had the same opportunity as I did to ask for the cost, and she decided not to Question. ask any questions at all, to simply do whatever her party said she should do. Why can't she admit this was the wrong decision? Thank you. Speaker, the leader of the third party is intent on having it both ways, Mr. Speaker. She suggests that she would not have cancelled the gas plant contingent on the cost, Mr. Speaker. But we heard in committee yesterday that her candidates were out saying that they would cancel the gas plant, Mr. Speaker. So I'm sorry, that high ground has been seated a long time ago. She cannot have it both ways, Mr. Speaker. The reality is, all parties said that they were going to cancel the gas plant. That was the position that everyone took. We implemented that decision, Mr. Speaker, and I was quite clear that I regret, I regret that there were public dollars that had to be spent in the way that they had to be spent. But the reality is, we made that commitment. We listened to the people of Mississauga and to the people of Oakville, and we made good on the, de on the decision that was agreed to by all parties in this House. Thank you. Your question. Well, Speaker, I find it quite disconcerting that the Premier of this province doesn't know the difference between a candidate and a leader. I don't know how many are out there candidates, but in our campaign, it's what the leader says and everybody else follows, Speaker. That's right. you know, my next question is That's to the right. Premier as well, Speaker. In tough economic times, these issues. Order, please. Order, please. Okay, so let's uh, let's start let's start mentioning individual writings. Uh, you really aren't helping. Please. Thank you. Questions for the speak uh, for the uh, premier speaker. In tough economic times, it's these very issues that matter, and they matter a great deal. And people are worried in these times as well about falling further and further behind. Now, the Premier tells everybody in this province that the cupboard is bare, and she's telling families that they're going to have to be paying more. I apologize for the interruption. Please stop the clock. The Minister of Community and Social Services will come to order. And the, minister, uh, the member from uh, Glengarry Prescott Russell. I've got the seats memorized. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. Thank you. Leader. Yet the government's moving ahead with a new corporate tax loophole worth $1.3 billion a year, while public sector CEO salaries are climbing everywhere from the OLG uh, to hospitals. Question. When is the Premier going to see that this is the wrong direction and it's people that should be coming first? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I'm just going to draw a line between a comment that the uh, leader made uh, before she asked that question to say that, Mr. Speaker, I'm part of a team, Mr. Speaker. Uh, That's how I work. And the difference between candidates and leaders for me, Mr. Speaker, leadership is about working with candidates, about working with all of the members of the team, Mr. Speaker, and being on the same page and understanding exactly what it is we stand for as a collectivity, Mr. Speaker. that when the candidates that were part of who thought they were part of the NDP team were talking about canceling the gas plant they thought that that was the position mr speaker we know that the people of oakville and the people of mississauga understood that that was the position of the NDP mr speaker we made good on that promise final, final final supplementary i don't believe it's my final oh sorry I apologize. Uh, I was quite excited, so I forgot to check it off. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, I guess the, the people will decide what kind of leadership they want in this province. I think the people want leadership that takes responsibility for their team uh, and actually provides 
the lead, which is what we do in the New Democratic Party. But you know what? The Premier had a chance to ask questions about the gas plant costs, and she didn't ask a single question about something that was going to cost the public over a billion dollars, or almost a billion dollars. And I don't know what she has to say to the people of this province, because she certainly didn't say it yesterday in committee. People are struggling right now, Speaker. They're worried about their jobs. They're worried about health care. They're worried about the cost of everyday life. And today they see in the paper that their government, once again, gave away more than half a billion dollars to make a political problem disappear for them. And now they're asking them, they're planning to ask them, those very people, for more and more and money, more and more money, when they're already having a strained postal budget. Does the Premier think it's fair that a government spends billions of dollars on CEO salaries increasing, on corporate tax loopholes, on cancelled gas plants, while asking people to pay more? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So let me just let me just make that connection I said I was going to make about being a team and we're all in this together. The reality is, Mr. Speaker, that the budget that we will table tomorrow speaks to the needs of the people of the province, Mr. Speaker. It speaks to the needs of making sure that we have a, a fiscally responsible uh, um, uh, Treasury <laughs> budget in place, and at the same time, Mr. Speaker, that we invest in the things that we know are going to make people's lives better. And that means making sure that home care is in place, Mr. Speaker making those investments, making sure that, uh, that the infrastructure that's necessary for economic growth in small and rural communities, Mr. Speaker, that their roads and the bridges are dealt with, because I know that municipalities struggle with that, Mr. Speaker, making sure that young people have access to placements, to co-ops, Mr. Speaker, so that they can find their way into the workforce. Those are the concerns, and I understand that, and I know that the, that the leader of the third party agrees that those are issues we should be focused on. That's what will be in our Thank budget, you. Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. Speaker, New Democrats have been very clear. Now is not the time to be opening up a brand new $1.3 billion tax loopholes so, loophole so that corporations don't have to pay their HST. And we've been clear as well. These are tough times, and we shouldn't be making, making it tougher for families by asking them to pay more while corporations pay less. My question to the Premier is, will Thursday's budget close the brand new $1.3 billion corporate tax loophole, or will we see the same old status quo that leaves people falling further and further behind? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know that the, the Minister of Finance has answered that question many times in the sense that he's working with the federal government. There is a federal government component and responsibility to this, Mr. Speaker. And we are we are working to close some of the loopholes that what the what the leader of the third party is talking about is not exactly a loophole. It is a it's a constraint of the tax regime, Mr. Speaker. But the reality is that he's working on that. Underneath her question uh, is an issue around building transit for people in the GTHA, Mr. Speaker, and the reality is we believe that it's very important that we have a, a plan to build that transit going forward. We don't have another 40 years to wait, Mr. Speaker, and the single Answer. moms who are trying to get their kids to school and trying to get to work, they don't have time to wait either, Mr. Speaker, so we need to get on that, and I would Thank expect you. that the third party would be right with us Thank and you. the member for Trinity Spadina leading that. Thank you. No question. The member from Nicholson. Thank you, uh, Speaker. This morning, my question uh, uh, is for the Premier. Premier, yesterday at the Justice Committee, we had sworn testimony from Ontario Power Authority's CEO, Colin Anderson, that, quote, everybody, quote, in the government knew the cost of the Oakville gas plant cancellation was more than $40 million. Despite you and your entire government clinging to the $40 million number all these months, you finally admitted to the Justice Committee that you knew the cancellation indeed was much more. What you didn't tell the committee is when you knew. Premier, is the reason because you and others have stood there in this legislature time and time again telling us one thing when you knew something else to be true. Is that why, Premier? Shameful. Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, I have in my hand a memorandum of understanding dated September 24, 2012. The same day that this memorandum was dated, uh, it went on the website, it was posted on the website of the Ontario Power Authority. I find it absolutely appalling, Mr. Speaker, that that critic did not read this document. Not only that, 
He did not read the 261-page contract that sets out the arrangement between TransCanada and the province on this particular issue. Mr. Speaker, it's very, very clear from this document. There are some costs. That number is identified, and there's a range of other items, savings as well as additional costs, that are included in this document. So the whole world knew, including him, if he read this document, that there were other costs and savings that had to be calculated in the OFO plan. Discreet! The, uh, the member from Prince Edward Hastings will come to order. The member from the P and Carleton, oops, I mean the member from Lambton, Kent, Middlesex will come to order. <laughs> Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Perhaps a page could send a glass of water over to the minister. His face is almost as red today as the Premier's was all day yesterday during the uh, testimony. <laughs> Premier, we've now seen that your government will say anything to stay in power. You continue to say one thing when the opposite is true. Mississauga cancellation is $180 million. Nope, it's $275. Oakville is $40 million. Nope, oops, it's $310 million. You said you didn't know anything, but it's your signature, Premier, on the Cabinet documents that started this whole process. You're all over this, Premier, and by not telling us when you knew what you knew, you've shown us you're part of this scandal. Why should we ever trust anything you say again? Well said. Well said. Well said. Well said. Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker. The member from Bruce Gray Owen South, come to order. The member from Simcoe Gray, come to order. He's tilting at windmills, Mr. Speaker, because he refused to read the document. He refused to read the document that identifies that there will be future costs and savings of the Oakville plan. Mr. Speaker, he continues to say that that Colin Anderson said that well, everybody knew. Well, Mr. I agree with Colin Anderson. Everybody knew. The only reason why he doesn't know, he did not read the document that says there will be additional costs, additional savings that need to be calculated. Order. The member from Durham, come to order. I believe that's the second time. Carry on, please. The, uh, order. This document, Mr. Speaker, Sir. they've been trying to calculate the costs. And yesterday, Mr. Anderson went before the committee and he came with two different costs. Four weeks ago, he had a different cost, Thank Mr. You. Speaker. That's why we need the. Now, please. The member from Essex, no question. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, people want to look to Queen's Park and they want to see some leadership. Instead, this is what they see. They see a premier who says that she never even spoke with Dalton McGuinty about gas plants. They see a Liberal government writing blank checks to cancel private power deals because you ripped up contracts without any idea of how much it would cost. They see a premier who has known for months that the cost of canceling gas plants was not $40 million and not $180 million but knew full well that there were more costs coming and didn't bother to tell the families who are going to pay the bill. These are more examples of uh, the new government the being exactly the same as the old government. <laughs> Premier, Question. is this the sort of leadership that Ontarians should be expecting from this new government? Premier. Government House Leader. Government House Leader. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, you know, I, I... I'm still reeling a little bit by the admission by the leader of the New Democratic Party that even though her candidates said they would cancel, they didn't really mean it. And I'm wondering if the member can the tell bus. us what he's going to tell Frank Clegg, the chairman for Citizens for Clean Air, who told the committee, we met with all the parties and all the candidates and were given commitments by every candidate in the Oakville area they would support canceling the plan. We have Greg Rohn, the Coalition of Homeowners for Intelligent Power. He said, yes, the NDP, they were against the plan. He went on to say the NDP came in and attended our 
rally. The mayor of Vogueville, Rob Burton, our citizens organized their own effort to ask the province to rethink the proposed power plant. They won promises from all parties to stop the proposed power plant. Mr. Speaker, I could go on with the candidates with the commitments from the Democratic Party to cancel both plants. Perhaps the honourable member can explain. Back to the Premier. Premier, leadership means making tough decisions, and it also means being honest, not continuing to keep Ontarians in the dark despite months having months to correct the record. It means taking responsibility, not trying to blame the other guy when you've done exactly the same thing. I know the Premier keeps saying her government is new, so why does this Premier's leadership look exactly like the same as the last Premier's leadership. Mr. Speaker, I, uh, you know, I, uh, I, I can go on here. I think that the member's question uh, about leadership proves the point here. Hazel McCallion came before the committee, and you know what she said? She said the impression that was certainly given beyond a doubt, I think all parties would have cancelled it. There is no question about it. So I think she'll be quite surprised to learn uh, on the leader's statement today. But you know, Mr. Speaker, you can go right to the source here. Etobicoke Lakeshore, according to Tor Store News Service, September 16, 2011. Etobicoke Lakeshore NDP candidate Dion Coley also pledged to fight the plan. Dion National the Post, September 29, 2011. Local NDP candidate Andrew Sicka soon issued statements concurring with the new Liberal cancellation. Even Thanks, the member from Toronto, Dan Forth, told, told InsideToronto.com, we wouldn't build it. And Mr. Speaker, under we saw bus. today Thank all you. of them right under the bus. New question. The member from Ajax Pickering. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. 182 years ago today, on May 1st, Emily Stowe was born in Norwich, Ontario. Dr. Stowe went on to become the first female physician in Canada. To mark this date and to acknowledge the extraordinary service our doctors provide, we recognize May 1st as Doctors' Day. Doctors play a vital role in keeping everyone healthy. My constituents in Ajax Pickering want to be assured that they have access to a family doctor when they need one. Speaker, can the minister tell us what the government is doing to increase our doctors Question. in Ontario? Well, thank you, Speaker, and uh, thanks to the member from Ajax Pickering for this very important question. And I'd also like to acknowledge the member from Richmond Hill. Uh, he successfully introduced the motion to recognize May 1st as Doctors' Day back in 2011. Speaker, but most importantly, I want to say thank you to all of Ontario's doctors. They work so hard every day for Ontario patients. Speaker, we have made significant progress in recruiting new doctors right across the province. Today, we have 4,000 more doctors practicing in Ontario than we did in 2003. In Ajax and Pickering, it's a 40 percent increase, 190 new doctors practicing in Ajax Pickering. We're training more doctors. We've uh, increased the number of residency spots for international yes, medical sir. graduates, and more doctors are going to underserviced areas. Speaker, Healthcare Connect is working to connect patients who need doctors to doctors. Thank you. And thankfully, Speaker, 93 percent of us now Thank have you. a family doctor. Thank you, Minister. Speaker, this is not only good news for my constituents, but for all Ontarians. Having access to a family physician is important to everyone, but that's just one part of ensuring equitable access to primary health care. Speaker, not all of my constituents are easily available to visit a doctor's office or might have to see a specialist who practices in a location that might not be very close to their home. Speaker. Can the minister please let us know what we're doing to ensure that each and every Ontarian has access to a doctor despite any challenges that they might face? Thank you. Minister. Uh, Speaker, the member raises a very important point, and we're working hard to make sure that every uh, Ontarian has access to primary care. We made a commitment to Ontario diabetics that we would we say, if you want a doctor, a nurse practitioner, you're going to get one. We've made that. We've kept that commitment, Speaker. Now we're saying to Ontario seniors, 
We're going to make sure you get attached to primary care. Speaker, back in uh, December last year, we worked with the Ontario Medical Association uh, with a new agreement. That includes 30,000 more house calls for doctors. Right. It includes uh, after-hours care so people can get access to the care they need when they need it. Our agreement was all about improving quality of care for patients, and I'm very pleased it received overwhelming support from Ontario's doctors. We've increased Answer. the number of telemedicine visits and virtual visits more than tenfold since 2003, and we're going to continue to work with Ontario doctors to make sure patients get the right care, the right place, the right Thank time. You. The question, the member from Renfrew, Nicholson, Pembroke. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Premier. Premier, it's obvious that disclosing all you knew about your gas plant scandals is not part of your plan. In spite of the fact that seven witnesses, including OPA CEO Colin Anderson, have said that you and all of your cabinet knew all along that the costs of Oakville would be more than $40 million, you still refuse to reveal when you knew that. You claim that as a member of cabinet, you didn't know. You claim that as a meeting chair when the Oakville MOU was discussed, you didn't know. You claim that as Liberal, vice camp liberal campaign vice chair, you didn't know. And then as Premier, that you never knew that the cost far exceeded $40 million. Premier, Question. your claim is hard to accept. It's time for the legislature to decide. Will you call our want of confidence motion, Thank or you. will you continue to refuse Thank because you. you know your record is indefensible? Thank you. Thank you. Proceed, please. Proceed, please. Premier. Say it was a lot better. Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, do you know what's hard to accept is the double standard that exists here. The Premier of the province appeared in front of the committee yesterday and answered all the questions that were directed to her. She appeared, Mr. Speaker, as soon as she was invited. Let me tell you about the Progressive Conservative Party, which is yet to release any of its costing for the plants before the election, despite the YouTube videos and tweets and press conferences. Mr. Speaker, we asked the Leader of the Opposition to be there yesterday. He refused, and now he's looking at his schedule, maybe the 7th, maybe the 14th. But you know what, Mr. Speaker? We have asked three Progressive Conservative candidates to appear in front of the committee. One has outright refused. One was coming to the committee and then suddenly decided she couldn't. And another one is still thinking about it. So, Mr. Yeah, Speaker, I ask the honourable yeah. member in his supplementary to explain Answer. to us when Progressive Conservative Party candidates will be coming forward and talking about their Thank costing you. of these plants Thank in you. the last election. Thank you. Supplementary. When might you be inviting those candidates to your cabinet meeting? Premier, you just aren't getting it. The Ontario Power Authority has given their best guess of what the Oakville plant cancellation and relocation will cost, and it is 775% higher than the number you and your colleagues have repeatedly claimed. Yesterday, you had the opportunity to make a statement and to testify for, for 90 minutes about your version of the events. Premier, you failed to make your case. Your government's record has been laid bare. The members of this assembly are not buying what you're selling, and I am certain that the people of Ontario aren't buying it either. If you actually believe that you've done nothing wrong and deserve the confidence of this House, then call our want of confidence, our want of confidence motion for debate and let this Question. House decide. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Out. Speaker, I listened intently to the member's question, and I failed to hear any indication of what the Progressive Conservative numbers were, or about the presence of the candidates, or the testimony of the Leader of the Opposition. These are not political games, Mr. Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition made this a cornerstone. Both sides are not being helpful. Finish, please. 
Mr. Speaker, this was a cornerstone of their campaign. They had tweets, they had news releases, they had media interviews, and the leader of the opposition appeared. He starred in a YouTube video. They sent out thousands of robocalls, Mr. Speaker. I do not think it's unreasonable that we would like to hear from the candidate who made those robocalls. I do not think it's unreasonable that we'd want to hear from the candidate who put out this pamphlet saying the only party that will yes, stop the Sherway power plan is the Ontario PC party. And yet, Mr. Oh. Speaker, they evade the questions about their costing. They evade the presence Thank of their you. candidates. When will they come forward Thank to the you. committee, Mr. Your question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is uh, for the Premier. Nearly two years ago, Jordan Fram and Jason Chenier were buried in a run of muck accident at the St Sudbury Stoby mine. Their families are still waiting for answers about why they died in a preventable accident. When will the Premier do the right thing and call a public inquiry into this tragedy so that no more lives are lost on the job? Premier. Minister of Labour. Sure of Labour. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and I thank the, uh, the leader of the third party uh, for the question on a very important issue. The speaker, it's always very tragic when we hear about uh, a loss of a worker. Uh, in, in the case of uh, the tragedy that took place two years ago, uh, it was uh, tragic as well. And uh, the Minister of Northern Affairs and Mine and I had the chance to meet last, just last week. Uh, Wendy Frem, uh, one the, the mother of, uh, uh, of the person who passed away in that, uh, in that accident. Uh, speaker, of course, we need to continue to do more to ensure that we make our workplace, especially mines, uh, safe. And I have committed, along with, the, uh, with Minister Gravel, uh, to Wendy Fram, uh, that uh, we will work with her to ensure uh, that we are uh, taking steps uh, that no other son or, or daughter is lost yeah, in a mining accident in our yeah, province. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, last weekend I stood with Sudbury workers and their families to mark the day of mourning here in Ontario, and many of those steel workers are here with us today in the spectators' gallery. The miners who earn their living underground in this province deserve peace of mind, and their families deserve peace of mind. Families of Jordan Fram and Jason Chenier deserve answers, as do the families of the other nine miners who have lost their lives over the last five years, and in fact, the person who was killed yesterday in a mining accident about 50 kilometres outside of Wawa. Speaker. Will the Premier give these people what they need and call a public inquiry into the deaths at the Stoby mine and the safety in the mining industry altogether, Speaker, an industry which has changed rapidly over the last number of years and yet has not been reviewed for upgrades to its health and safety legislation for Question. over 30 years? Thank you very much, uh, uh, thank you very much, Speaker, and, and, and sympathies to the families of the worker who passed away uh, just outside Wawa as well. I had the chance to speak with the member from uh, Algoma, Manitoulin, about that incident as well and assured him that uh, I will work along with him uh, and my ministry to ensure that uh, we get all the answers. Speaker, in case of uh, the Stoby mine, there is a criminal trial that uh, date is announced in October. There will also going to be a mandatory coroner's inquest uh, in that instance. Uh, the Ministry of Labor is also involved in, in about four different health and safety blitzes uh, dealing with mining sector on very specific issues and they are uh, one just finished and there will be three more coming up through the summer and early next year. Speaker, we're also working through the uh, Mining Legislative Review Committee, which is part of the yes, uh, Occupational Health and Safety Act, and we are looking at an option as to how we can work with the co-chairs of that, of that committee and uh, find ways to make Thank our you. mining even more safer. Thank, Thank you. you very much. New question. New York, South well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Consumer Services. Today in Ontario, more than 80 per cent of our citizens use some form of a mobile device, and most of them have entered in some kind of a contract with a provider. In my own writing of your Southwestern, we are experiencing many issues with regards to cell phones. I would say that the most concerning is probably that of students being robbed of cell phones. But the other major source of complaints are about contracts. People are very confused about the language in contracts, about additional charges, and massive cancellation fees. I think we've all experienced that. Minister, I'm happy to learn that you introduced legislation to address this very issue. And, Speaker, through you to the Minister, I would like to ask the Minister Question. to share with us why you have chosen to 
take action now instead of waiting for the CRTC to develop the code of conduct. Good question. Yes, sir. Thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the member for York South Western for a very important question. I'm very pleased to rise to talk about the new Wireless Services Agreement Act. I also want to thank the Minister of Natural Resources, the MPP for Sault Ste. Marie, for showing strong leadership on this issue from the very beginning. Right on. And we all know there's been an explosion of the use of wireless uh, uh, communication devices in this province, Speaker, but unfortunately there's also been an explosion of complaints and issues around that. And in fact, a recent CRTC hearing commissioner for complaints oh. noted there's been a 250 percent increase in complaints over the past four years, a very significant number. Right and my ministry, the Ministry of Consumer Services, has received 740 Answer. calls and complaints in just uh, the last year. So there is need for clear action, Speaker, and the bill will give Ontarians the protection they're looking for. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Minister, I'm astonished at uh, to hear the number of complaints. I'm not entirely surprised because cell phones are one of the most uh, uh, widely used uh, consumer products with a large, complicated contract attached to it, but it's not entirely surprising to hear the number of complaints. Most consumers realize the from that uh, they already Bay have the Consumer Protection Act in place to protect them from a ethical practices, but with the complex web of problems that consumers encounter with their wireless services, there needs to be dedicated legislation to specifically address this issue. So, Speaker, through you to the Minister, can you please explain to this House Question. how the proposed Act will be providing more transparency and fairness to consumers? Thank you. Excellent. Thank Minister. you, Speaker. I'm very pleased to talk about the action, a strong action, our government's taking to help consumers in Ontario. This legislation has five major components, Speaker. First, it provides clarity. Contracts will have to be disclosed in plain language, easy to understand language. Second, it will require consumers to provide consent prior to any changes being made to current contracts. Third, it will include a maximum cap of $50 on cancellation fees. Four, the bill will require service providers to include all-in inclusive pricing predominantly on their ads. And five, if you are improperly billed and the provider refuses to pay, consumers will have the right for triple recovery of the amount owed. Additionally, Speaker, the bill will require service providers to stop building, billing immediately Answer. once the divorce device is reported lost or stolen. These measures are very strong, Speaker, and Thank will you. protect and empower consumers in Thank Ontario. You. Thank you. New question. Member from Newmarket, Aurora. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, four years ago, the uh, then Attorney General and uh, the most recent Minister of Energy tabled in this House a very prophetic bill, and it was passed by this House, and the, the uh, Premier voted for it. It was Bill 108, entitled An Act Respecting Apologies. Apologies is defined in this Act as an expression of sympathy or regret, a statement that a person is sorry, or any other words or actions indicating contrition or commiseration. I'd like to ask the Premier, after an hour and a half of admitting her responsibility for signing documents for spending some $858 million Question. of taxpayers' money Order. on a deal to save Liberal seats, will Thank you. the Premier stand up Thank and you. issue an apology to the people of Canada? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And if the member for Newmarket Aurora checks Hansard from yesterday and from this House, he will see that I have many times said that I regret, which is one of the words, one of the synonyms used to, de to, uh, many, many, to uh, define an apology. I have said, Mr. Speaker, over and over again that I regret that this situation happened. I regret that we, that we did not have a better process in place, Mr. Speaker. I regret that the costs were not clear, Mr. Speaker. I regret that public dollars had to be spent in this way in order to in order to relocate these gas plants, Mr. Speaker. And it must not happen again. We must have a better process going forward. And one of the things I said yesterday repeatedly was, I hope 
hope that the Justice Committee, having heard all of the witnesses, is going to be able to Answer. help and give some advice on how, going forward, we can avoid this situation ever happening again. Mr. Speaker. Speaker, $585 million was used to save Liberal seats. The Premier admitted that it was a decision by the Liberal Party of Ontario. The Premier admitted that she signed the Cabinet document to spend those funds. What we cannot and what people in this province cannot understand is why the Premier cannot stand in her place, reach deep down and say to the people of Ontario, I am sorry for what I did, for what our government did, and for what our party did. Why can the Premier not stand up and utter those words? What is keeping her from making that apology to the Question. people of Ontario? I ask the Premier one more time. Thank you. Dr. 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 Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker. I understand the passion that uh, motivates the, uh, the member opposite, Mr. Speaker. And I said yesterday, throughout the hour and a half that I was at the committee, Mr. Speaker, that I was as frustrated as they were, Mr. Speaker. We all agreed that. The clock, please. Stop the clock. Uh, the Minister of the Environment is not helpful when he continues to heckle while the answer is being put. It's not helpful. Please that we all agreed that these decisions should be made. We implemented the decision, Mr. Speaker, and everyone wanted to see that decision implemented because that's what they talked about during the campaign, Mr. Speaker. That was their position. We made that decision. We entered into a negotiation, Mr. Speaker, and I have said repeatedly that I regret that a better decision wasn't made up front and that we need to make sure that this doesn't happen again. But since I came into this office, Mr. Speaker, I have done everything everything in my power to make sure Thank that you. everyone had the information that they were asking. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. On Monday, a man who fired gunshots at his former manager and terrified a London neighbourhood was sentenced to seven years. However, he will serve less than half his sentence. The appalling conditions of the jail were cited by the judge as a reason for reducing his sentence. Speaker, is the minister okay with convicted criminals being prematurely released due to the terrible conditions at this jail? Mr. Speaker, uh, we respect the right of the judge to impose sentences yes. they de that they deem uh, appropriate under the law. We are aware of the concern regarding EMDC. We have, uh, with the administration of the, uh, the jail, we have uh, started, uh, we have developed a 12 point plan, and we are uh, working on the uh, improvement of that, uh, that uh, jail. And I've also uh, suggested what will be implemented. It's to have kind of a board of director for that jail, uh, um, comprised of citizens in the community to help us to redress the situation in, uh, at the EMDC. Thank you, Mr. Thank Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, the conditions at Elgin Middlesex Detention Center have long been deplorable. And workers have told this government that they were at risk, and so were their ability to properly do their job. Now we're seeing that these conditions are resulting in reduced sentences for convicted criminals. Why hasn't the minister taken this issue seriously enough to prevent this kind of fiasco from happening in our correctional system? Thank you, minister. As I said in the past, Mr. Speaker, the EMDC situation and EMDC jail is our top priority. Both, you know, my office and the uh, Ministry of Correctional Services have been uh, following the situation. The uh, Deputy Minister, the Assistant Deputy Minister, have been there many times. We've uh, changed the uh, administration at the, the jail. All of this, you know, to try to improve the situation, and I take the concern very seriously. That's why I went myself 
to visit the jail and make sure that we have a plan to redress the situation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from Scarborough, Agent Court. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health, um, Minister of Education. A great education enables our young people to succeed later in life. Our government has increased our investment in the education system by 45 percent since 2003. As a result, we have seen tremendous progress in student achievement. For example, graduation rates have increased by 15 percentage points since 2003. However, we also know that in order for students to be, do well in school, they need to be healthy students. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, can you please inform the House what you're doing to make our schools a healthy place to learn? Thank you, Minister. Yes, thank you very much, Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member for, from Scarborough Agent Court for her advocacy on behalf of healthy schools. Speaker, we know that a healthy student is an active learner. That's why our government is committed to creating an environment in our schools where healthy choices are the easiest choices students can make. Our school food and beverage policy sets nutrition standards for foods and beverages sold in schools so that our students have access to good quality food. And I'd like to thank the dairy farmers of Ontario who are here this morning <laughs> for their participation in milk programs in many of our elementary schools. But we also yes, set out a comprehensive healthy school strategy, which includes daily phys ed, funding for all our boards to have health, uh, mental health leaders, support for mental health nurses in our schools, Thank and you. a healthy school framework to assist schools. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our schools are not just a place to learn, but also a place called community hubs. They're places where students gather before and after school or on weekends to learn and to play. This is quite evident in many of my schools in Scarborough Agent Court. In one of my visits to Dr. Norman Bethune Collegiate, the principal had to get on the PA system to remind the students that it is now 5 p.m. and students need to vacate the school buildings unless they're involved in extracurricular activities. Making our school accessible for community program is a great way to get our students to be more active. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, can you please inform this House of the work you're doing to make our school more accessible to the community? Thank you, Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. And our government has made schools more accessible to the community because the member from Scarborough Agent Court is absolutely correct that what happens after school is important in the lives of students, too. This school year, we're providing $42 million through our Community Use of Schools program. This funding supports healthy, active lifestyles by enabling not-for-profit groups to offer affordable activities to our young people. And as part of our Community Use of Schools program, we are providing $7.5 million to help provide free access to school space outside of school hours in communities that need it most. Through our Sir. work, 220 priority schools offer school space at no charge to not-for-profit group. Speaker, we will continue to work with local profits to service yeah, yeah. community hubs. Question, a member from Perth, Wellington. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Speaker, the Premier's testimony yesterday wasn't just evasive. It was downright suspect. When asked repeatedly about when she first learned of the so-called buckets of costs, the Premier ducked and dodged, attempting to avoid accountability. Speaker, while the weak-kneed Liberal apologists and the NDP may be willing to turn a blind eye, the PC caucus will hold this scandal-plagued right. government to account. Here, here. So I ask the Premier this. Will she finally uphold her moral obligation to and call the PC want of confidence motion for a vote? Good question. Mr. Speaker, let's, uh, let's review the Premier's uh, actions in this regard. She was the one that came to uh, office as Premier and asked the Auditor General to look into the Oakville situation. She's the one that called for a select committee of this legislature, which was rejected by the opposition. Rejected. She was the one who asked the government members to put forward a motion for a government-wide search for relevant documents. It was voted down by the opposition. It was the Premier who went before committee yesterday and spent an hour and a half asking 
or answering Unlike questions the that candidate. were posed by the Progressive Conservatives. Mr. Speaker, there's a quote that I'd like to share with everyone from Oakville Mayor Rob Burton, and he said the following. Anyone who wishes to criticize the cost of cancelling it would do everybody a favour if they would explain how they would have done it differently, oh, Mr. Speaker. I couldn't put it better than Mayor Burden. Answer, thank you. Supplementary, the member from Chatham, Kent, Essex. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. Again to the Premier, uh, that was a pathetic response. That response might be, in fact, enough to uh, satisfy the weak and feeble members uh, of the NDP's Toronto caucus, but taxpayers in my riding expect better. Speaker, instead of busying themselves capitulating to NDP extortion, the Liberals should be focused on getting to the truth of the gas plan. Uh, the member will withdraw. I withdraw. They should be focused on getting to the truth of the gas plant scandal. But it's clear, Speaker, this government is determined to play games. This one is hide and seek. You hide the real cost of the gas plant scandals and force the opposition to seek out the truth. And the truth we're finally getting hurts. Premier, you have lost the moral authority to govern. But my question to you is this. Do you have the moral fiber? to call the PC confidence motion today. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, the honourable member candidate. talks about games. I'd like to just Mr. Speaker, I'd like to just inform everyone I've just received a note, Mr. Speaker. The Justice Committee will not be sitting tomorrow, and there's a reason why, Mr. Speaker, because the list of witnesses were all former Conservative candidates, and not a single one, Mr. Speaker, is going to show up. Not a single one is going to show up and discuss the costing, the analysis that was done by the Progressive Conservative Party about the promises that they made at the door, in media, through news releases, in the Twitterverse, on YouTube, through robocalls, why their leaders stood up and said, done, done, done. They were available that day, Mr. Speaker, to stand beside, beside the leader, but they're not available tomorrow, Mr. Speaker, to answer some questions of the Justice Committee. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The, Ch the Chichiman Ferry is a crucial link between Tobomori and South Bay Mouth on Manitoulin Island, crucial to businesses, tourists, and students. It's contribu it contributes $25 million a, a year to local economies and transports over 200,000 passengers a year. It's supposed to open up for summer on Friday, but it won't because the Ontario government and the federal government refuse to take responsibility for dock repairs needed to address with low water levels. The Owen Sound Transportation Company has been raising concerns about the threat of low water levels for over a year. The cost of repairs is less than $300,000, and the benefits are in the tens of millions. When will the Ontario government stop trying to find ways to avoid its shared responsibility for the ferry Question. and start playing a constructive role in getting the ferry running now before Thank local you. economies and businesses are devastated? Northern Development and Mines. The Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Uh, thanks so much, Mr. Speaker. And this is a very serious situation, certainly one that we are determined to find a solution. I appreciate the question. The fact is, the current uh, low water levels of Lake Huron are, are putting the Chichimon Ferry in a position where it cannot safely dock the, at the wharves. The work that needs to get done is immediate work. Uh, the wharves are owned and operated by Transport Canada. We have a legal agreement. We have a legal agreement with them for them to maintain that. I had a discussion uh, yesterday with the federal minister who is. Uh, who is at this stage not prepared to do that, I'm, we're going to keep the pressure on to make sure that happens. But let me say this, if I may, Mr. Speaker. We recognize the importance uh, in terms of tourism and the economy. We are prepared to find a solution. The work needs to get done, and I am determined to see that work does get done so that Chichimon can operate as soon as possible. Sir, thank you. The member from Timmins, James Bay, on a point of order. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Just uh, for the record, the reason the committee is not meeting tomorrow, according to the clerk, it's not a point of order. On behalf of the uh, member from Willowdale, uh, guests uh, Mother uh, Faye Penn and Aunt uh, Diane Penn are here to observe Ka uh, Katrina Penn. We welcome them to the house. 
This uh, no deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.